Well, good evening. We want to welcome you here to our Discover Hope series uh, today, and we're so delighted to be here. We want to welcome you who are here tonight. We want to welcome you, those who are joining us online. We hope that if you've been joining us since last evening, that you've been blessed, you've been encouraged, you've received extra hope uh, for the, the day to come, for the weeks to come, for the years to come. Lord knows uh, we are thankful for the meetings that we've been having. Uh, just before we go into our meeting tonight, just want to let you know what's going to be happening here. Uh, tonight, uh, this evening, uh, the, the title of the message is Roses and Barbed Wire. Roses and Barbed Wire, the reason why there's so much suffering. Now, Discover Hope means a whole lot to me personally. In brief, is that my daughter has the name Hope. She has the name Hope. We gave her that name years ago. And it's because when we were about to have her, uh, the doctor said that your child is going to have, a, most likely going to have a disability. And would you like to abort your child? And that was terrifying for us as newly expected parents. And so we told the doctor, no, we will not, we'll not do that. But it was still a terrifying time. And so what we did at this time of unexpected uh, unexpected as to what the future would hold for our family, we placed our hope in God. And my wife and I, we believe that we were inspired to give our daughter the name of Hope. And every time we would call her by the name of Hope before she was born, it was a reminder to us that regardless of what would come, that our confidence, our, our security, our peace of mind would come from our surrendering everything to God. Now, whether whatever happened, God was going to take care of that. Now, thank God our daughter was born. She didn't have a disability. But we trust that no matter what happens in life, we can find a sense of peace, a sense of uh, uh, comfort, a sense of security by placing our hope in God. And so if you're here tonight, if you're joining us here online, we hope that you will experience such hope and discover that over this uh, evening and the rest of these series. We'll be meeting here for the next several days up until March 18th. And so we hope that you're blessed. And again, welcome. Good evening. May I invite every one of you who are here in the sanctuary and also those who are online. Shall we come now to the Lord in our opening prayer? Let's invite him tonight. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, our great God who created us, who brought us here together, here in the sanctuary and in online platform. Tonight, Lord, we would like to thank you and praise you for being our God who knows the best for your children and to all of us. Amidst of all the trials, amidst of those difficulties in life, 
we believe and we have hope that we have a God who knows what is best for your children. Tonight, O oh Lord, we pray that may you bless all of us here and online through your servant, Pastor Brad Torp, as he will deliver your message. May you anoint his lips, O oh Lord, so that all of us will be blessed and will discover the hope of glory, which is our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for answering our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good to see you back. Uh, I know that some of you are watching us all over British Columbia, more than 20 venues that we are having. And by the way, today, tonight, we're going to show you pictures of three venues uh, around British Columbia. And we'll try every evening to show you pictures of those. Uh, tonight, we are showing you the picture of Nanaimo venue, then Prince George, and also from Ukrainian group here in uh, Burnaby. So this is Nanaimo. And then we also have the picture of Ukrainian group. And the last but not the least, up north, Prince George. Prince George, that's right, that's right. And Prince George is good because he has McBride next to him, so. But that's all okay. <laughs> when you have McBride, you are good. By the way, just one more time reminder, tonight is the night to do what's right. And this is to move your clock one hour ahead. How are we moving our clock tonight? Yes, one hour ahead. If you don't, you know what's gonna happen? You think it's seven o'clock coming here, here by the time it's gonna eight, be here eight and we are gonna be gone. So please move your clocks one hour ahead so we can meet tomorrow here on time, okay? So uh, I just wanna remind you about questions. Uh, we received four questions. So tonight after Brad's presentation, we'll try to answer them. And also to remind you, the phone number is 778-400-9533. 778-400-9533. And if you don't know Brad by now, you will never, never know him. So there is no need for me to introduce him. He is a well-known, busy boy and ready to rumble. Good evening, friends. I'm so happy to have the privilege of being here. And I'm not sure about the rumble, but we're ready to go. <laughs> I'm looking forward to the opportunity of, uh, of answering the questions and discussing together with Pastor Peter right after the program. So we just uh, hope that each of you will be, uh, uh, will have questions for us. And you don't have to wait till after the program. Please um, give, us, give us questions even now as uh, we're in the middle of the program, either by phone or text, whatever, whatever is appropriate for you. This evening, our presentation, our Bible study is entitled Roses and Barbed Wire. You know, they're the absolute opposite. On one hand, there are roses, the beauty of the flowers, etc. But on the other hand, there is the horror of the injustice that is happening around us, which we could say is described by the barbed wire. Good God, bad world, why? To be perfectly candid with you, this is the most difficult question that Christians, that Bible-believing uh, individuals have to struggle with. Why, if there is an almighty, all-powerful God, does so much sickness, suffering, death, and tragedies exist? Why? And if there is an almighty powerful God who is gracious, why doesn't he do something about it? And people have struggled with this issue for decades, for years, for millenniums. This is a struggle that has touched every heart. And so tonight we're picking up one of the most important topics and address it from the biblical perspective as to why there's this problem exists. Now tonight in our outline, we're going to be dealing with where did this whole controversy begin, this issue, this problem of suffering, sickness, and death? Who's responsible? Where did it come from? What are the issues involved? How does it apply to our individual lives? 
We're going to be taking all of those particular questions up, but before we do, friends, I want to just pause and recognize the very, very practical, personal sensitivity that this issue means. Many of us, in fact, every person, in some way, shape, or form, family or directly with themselves, is struggling with the problem of pain and suffering. We all are. Years ago, when I was working here in Vancouver, back in the late 1970s, early 80s, my father had a tragic car accident with a friend of ours who was driving with him. The friend was killed in that car accident, and my dad spent 72, 71 days in the Royal Columbian Hospital, which is a stone throw from this particular building. And I've had the opportunity of visiting hundreds of times into homes where there's been sickness, and suffering, death, pain. And I just want to say tonight that as we look at this issue, our hearts are with you. This is tragic. It's one of the dilemmas of what we deal with as human beings in a sin-cursed world. And so, friends, tonight as we're talking about this subject, I want to be sensitive, very sensitive to the hurt and the pain that we're all going through. And I just pray that someday soon, God's great kingdom, where there will be no more sickness, suffering, and death, will be established, and you and I can be part of that kingdom forever. So tonight, we want to look at this question. Where did sickness, suffering, and death come from? And there is a very key theme that is found in the Bible, and that is that love is based on free choice. I want you to keep that very clearly in your, as, in your mind as we go through the, our study tonight, that the very essence of God, the Bible says God is love, and love is always based on free choice. We cannot have, we cannot have love unless there is free choice. And when you look at the tragedy of what's happening in our world tonight, whether it's refugees who are displaced or children who are exploited in terrible working conditions, whether it's tornadoes, whether it's the tragedy of war around the world, it matters not. We are a people who are behind enemy lines. We are attacked by Satan. And this, the, what this world is faced with, my friend, is not the way God intended it to be. So as we look into the Bible, we find that there is a very, very clear understanding of where this problem began. And I want us to go back in the pages of the Bible right to the very beginning, as the Bible describes it in the book of Job. In the book of Job, it describes that there was this great heavenly parliament, or a heavenly congress, however you wish to describe it. And it says in that passage, the dare, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan, believe it or not, Satan also came among them. Now, friend, get the picture. There's this great heavenly Asai, this great huge uh, heavenly Congress parliament that is taking place, and Satan shows up among them. And the Lord said to Satan, now there's God speaking to Satan, where do you come from? And Satan said, answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth, from walking up and down, back and forth on it. Now, friends, in the Bible, the shoe and walking back and forth is a symbol of ownership. It's a symbol of dominion. And so when Satan said, I've been, I come from earth and I'm walking back and forth on it, he was saying, I am the owner of planet earth and I am the one who represents planet earth. And so God said to him, uh, said to Lucifer, have you considered my servant Job? Do you know my, one of my people down there on planet earth, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. Wow. <laughs> Do you know that man down there on planet earth? And what did Lucifer, or Satan respond? He said, so Satan answered the Lord and says, <laughs> does God fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him and around his household and around all that he has on every side? In other words, he was saying, God, you, were, you have been bribing Job, bribing Job to serve you. You protect him. You've made him wealthy. He has a wonderful family. There is absolutely no reason why he shouldn't serve you because you've, you've put this hedge of protection around him. Excuse me, you've blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But now, ha ha, <laughs> Satan is speaking. Get the picture now. Satan is speaking. He says, stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will surely curse you to his face. 
He's just your pawn. He's just doing what you've paid him off to do. And God said to him, said to this great being, and notice the, 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 the controversy. Notice the conflict, my friend. This is vital to understand that here is this battle between good and evil, and it is taking place up in heaven. And we're going to see more evidence of that in a moment. So here is a battle over moral freedom. Now, uh, we, we need to pause there and understand that what is happening here is not so much, is not an issue of, uh, of, uh, of two equal forces. We're talking here today about the almighty powerful God of the universe that we studied about this morning. Who, one of his beings, Lucifer, Satan, is rebelling against him and saying, God, you, <laughs> you think that Job serves you because he loves you. And he doesn't. He serves you because you, you're bribing him. And the issue here is not whether who's got the most atomic bombs that can throw at each other or some conflict of power like that. No, no, no. It's a moral battle, an issue over the question of what is love. I want to be very clear tonight that the Bible does not teach the concept of theological dualism. The idea of dualism is that there are two equal gods who both equally are responsible for this planet and the universe and all such things, and that they're fighting back and forth. One god does this and one god does that, and they go back and forth at each other. That's not what the Bible is speaking of here. It's not an issue of force and war. Not at all, friend. Now, force and war come into play as a subsidiary or as a secondary issue, but the Bible here is teaching that there is one almighty God, and there is this bright brilliant being that we will learn more about in a moment, who has attacked his character. Now, we find evidence of this later on in the Gospels in Jesus Christ. Jesus was asked a, a question by his disciples. Excuse me. Jesus was, Jesus, first of all, told a parable. It was one of his teaching stories. And he described a great field. And in the field, there were these thorns and thistles came up. And the servants in the story come to the master and said, where have these things come from? Where, where, why, why were these thorns and thistles? If you planted good seed. Why have these bad th things come up? And in the parable, Jesus explained, he said, he said to them, an enemy has done this. Now, when we look into the Bible, we find that throughout the scriptures, the Bible is describing this conflict between the Almighty God and Satan and Satan's angels. We'll learn more about that in a moment. But there is a conflict over who and what God is, and it's an enemy. It's not a question of who has the most power. It's a question of who has the most influence. And so, my friends, as we look at the scriptures, here we're finding a, a question of the, of the influence that God wants to have in each of our lives. Revelation, the book of Revelation, reveals a, a titanic struggle between good and evil, between these moral forces of what really constitutes loyalty and allegiance to God. Uh, here we go to Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 to 9. A war broke out in heaven. Michael. Michael is uh, one of the names of Jesus in his role. That, and, and keep in mind, friend, there are many, many different names for God in the Bible and of Jesus. But the name Michael is God, Jesus' war name. It is when he stands up and he goes to battle for his people, okay? So here is Michael. This is another name of Jesus. War broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail. Okay, here's a battle. Now, this is actually a physical battle. Nor was there place found for them in heaven any longer, so that the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old who was called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So let's, let's just realize what the Bible is saying here. First of all, there was a war up in heaven. War began up there. Jesus and, his, and the angels who were loyal to him were fighting against Satan and the angels loyal to him. And... Satan is cast out, and the literal Greek uh, language here describes he was cast out into the spaces between the worlds, between the earth. He was cast out of heaven. He ultimately came down here to this earth. 
Now here's the question, why on earth was there war in heaven? Where did this dragon come from? Well, let's just go back in the Bible. Ezekiel chapter 28 describes it. It says, thus says the Lord God, you were the seal of perfection. Now this is talking about Satan. It's talking about Lucifer. His original name was Lucifer. Lucy, is, Lusa is the, uh, the, the name for light. Lucifer means the light bearer, the one who carries the light. His name was originally the light bearer. Thus says the Lord God, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. This being was not some horrible, you know, sometimes we get these middle-aged pictures of the devil with a long tail and a fork in his hand ready to throw people into hell and all these grotesque, ugly, awful pictures. I, you know, just make your hair curl. That's how bad the, 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 these artists describe Satan. No, my friend, the Bible says he was the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. If you met Mr. Lucifer, you'd say, oh, whoa, whoa, what an incredible being. And it says, you were the anointed cherub that covers. Now, let, let me explain the symbolism here. In the Old Testament church, or sanctuary as it was called, there were three compartments. One was, or three areas I should say. One where the people would come in with their offerings. The second area was where they had an altar to, uh, for, for um, burning incense. Then there was uh, some other furniture. But in the most holy spot, there was a cabinet. Um, like a credenza, and it was made out of solid gold, and on the top of it was a slab of gold, and over, over the, the slab of gold were two angels made out of, or two angels' wings figured together, and there was the covering, they were called covering angels, and the visible, bright, burning presence of God dwelt among, above the mercy seat, but between the two angels. These were called the covering angels. Now, that was a human, limited, shadowy picture of what actually is up in heaven and the position of real angels and real situations up in heaven. So when the Bible describes that he was the anointed cherub that covers, it says that the original position of Lucifer was that he was one of the actual real angels, which was right next to the visible, real presence of God. You couldn't get closer. He wasn't some angel way off in the choir, you know, a million angels or a billion angels away. No, no, my friend. He was right next to God. And here the Bible says, I established you and you were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. You were perfect in all your ways from the day that you were created. What? You were perfect. Lucifer was perfect in all his ways from the days that he was created till iniquity, iniquity was found in you. What's the Bible telling us here? It's telling us that there was a rebellion right at the throne of God. One of the angels who was next to God, who had access to all of the fabulous resources of heaven, was the angel who rebelled against God. Iniquity was found in him. Now please notice, friend, Let's, 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 let's be really clear. God, God did not create a demon. God did not create a demon. He created only perfect things. Now, what, let's go on. <laughs> Ezekiel goes on to give a psychoanalysis, <laughs> a complete debrief of this rebellion that happened. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. He became proud of all of the fantastic assets that he had. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your own splendor. He became egoistic, he became proud, and he wanted an, a, a higher position than he actually had. Now, friends, why did these things happen? Why did that happen? Why did God allow that rebellion to go on? Here's this bright, billion, bright, brilliant being who wants to, is right next to his throne. And, well, why didn't God just zap him? Well, my friends, God does not want robots. God does not want robots. He doesn't want robotic response from you. He doesn't want a robotics response from any one of us. Now let's just think for a moment. Let's just pause for a moment. How do you uh, get things done? 
How do you motivate people to do something? May I suggest that it boils down to one of three options. One is you can, you can scare a person to death. You put a gun on their back, a gun to their head, a knife on their back, and say, you either do this or you die. Now, I mean, there's a lot of people who will jump and say, uh, they'll jump. And the question is, how high? <laughs> they, will, they will respond very, very quickly if they're frightened badly enough. And we all know of situations that are happening in our world today where there are people, terrible, terrible situations of conflict, where people are being forced to go into conflict. They don't want to, but they're being forced because there's a gun behind them and there's a gun ahead of them. It's a horrible situation. Fear is a phenomenal motivator, but you know fear doesn't hold. You know these uh, little labels on the, on the boxes of cigarettes and tobacco? It says scientists, or scientists have determined that tobacco smoking is a cause of lung cancer. And that's been well established in, 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 in uh, you know, scientific studies. How many people listen to it? You know, you can scare a person with all sorts of gory pictures of lung cancer and everything else, but, it, but a person doesn't respond to fear. Now, what's the second way to motivate a person? The second way is you pay them. You give enough carrots, the rabbit will jump high enough or whatever the case may be. So if you get somebody and you want to do it, you say, well, I'll give you $50 an hour. No, that's enough. Well, how about 100 No, how about 500 And finally, everybody, so to speak, so to speak, has their price. You can motivate people by reward. But what's the third way? It's by love. And love is freely given. Love is a volunteer. Love between my wife and myself is not based on money or fear. Now, once in a while, she threatens to whack me over the head or something. <laughs> I've got to tease her a little bit. No, no, my friends, she never does that. But my point is this. Love creates tremendous motivation. And in God's character, the Bible says God is what? God is what? Is love. And he did not want anybody, any being, anywhere in the universe to ever serve him because of fear or favor. It was only because of love. And love comes because of respect and admiration. I think all of us who have been parents have had our little ones come up and throw their arms around us for some particular reason. What happened? Give a big slobbering kiss, whatever. Oh, Dad, I love you, or whatever the case may be. Man, what a joy it is when somebody spontaneously, freely expresses love. And that's what heaven wants. Love is based on free choice. If you really love, there is always the freedom to choose. And so in heaven's great plan, the character of God is God is love. So any use of reward, any use of fear. Now follow what happens here. Uh, Satan, in his accusations against Job, remember right at the very beginning in the book of Job, which, we're, which we quoted here, uh, uh, Lucifer says, ha ha, God, you are paying him off. You're bribing him to serve you. And God says, no. And my friend, love is always based on free choice. Now Isaiah gives us also a further psychoanalysis of, uh, of uh, Lucifer's rebellion. And he says, how are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? For you said in your heart, now here, get it. This is what Lucifer was saying in his heart. He was saying, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Now here you have it. Here is this being who was the covering cherub over God's presence himself who says, I want to sit at the Mount of the Congregation on the farthest side of the north. That's a reference in the Bible to the history of Israel where they got the Ten Commandments off of Mount Sinai and it was pictured as coming from the mountain on the north. Here it says, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I'm going to be the very supreme being of the universe. I will be the most high. Friends, do you get the issue here? Here are these two beings. God allows him to continue. Why? Because if he destroyed him, what would happen? Right away, everybody would say, uh oh, I gotta stand really firm. I gotta do exactly as I'm told. I've gotta be a parrot. I've gotta mimic exactly what he wants, or else, big go off with my head. 
Or, what's the other? Enough reward, he will do what you want. So God did not do this. So Lucifer wanted a higher position. He wanted an exalted throne. He wanted looter rulership and, and dominion. He wanted to be above all that. But love is the foundation of God's government. And my friend, never forget it. You know, the Bible says in the book of Genesis, in the book of Genesis, chapter 1 tells us how God created all the world in, in seven days. But in chapter 2, it defines what humanness is. It goes through and it describes what it means to be human. And one of the characteristics is that God gave all of us a moral choice. He gives every one of us a moral choice. The tree, the knowledge of good and evil says, God, don't do it. Because, don't touch it. Don't eat of it. Because if you do it, you will die. If God hadn't given that freedom of choice, they would have been robots. But there was that freedom of choice that every one of us here tonight, those of you who are on the locations around, around British Columbia, all of us who are watching online, friend, the thing that God respects the most is your freedom of choice. At the end of the day, God is not going to twist your arm. He's not going to pour gold into your pocket to help you, make you do what he wants to do. He's going to say, look at me. Learn about me. Get to know me better. <laughs> and then if, I, if, if you love me, then I will, ex no, not if, I, not if you love me, I will accept you. He accepts us right as we are. And he wants us to grow and to love him more and more in our walk with him. So what happened? Here's this bright, billion, brilliant being, Lucifer, who rebels against God and says, I will be like the Most High. I'm going to be the king. I'm going to be the one who makes the laws. So how does he go out? What does he go and do? It says in Ezekiel chapter 28, he says, you've set your heart as the heart of a god. Here he is, this being who is a created being, the angel who covers, is now saying, I'm going to go out and I'm going to act like God. I'm going to act like God. And so what does he start to do? He attacked God by misrepresenting his character and by creating questions and doubt. Now, here he comes down to this planet. Genesis chapter 1 describes a perfect world. It says that whatever God had created, behold, it was very good. It wasn't just good. It was very good. There was no signs of pollution. There was no signs of any of the problems that are, exist in our environment today. None of these uh, un un unequal global warming issues or anything like that. No, 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 my friend. It was all the, ex it was a perfect world. So what did he do? He created pain, destruction, war, personal conflict, personal suffering, and blames it on God. First area that Satan attacked is the personal relationships. The personal relationships. He starts off with, with uh, well, he, he, he tricks Eve to, uh, to take the fruit and eat it, to rebel. And Eve then takes it to Adam, and Adam takes the fruit and eats it. And then what happens? He comes along and when God says, what have you done? What does Adam do? He says, that woman you gave me, she is the one who did it. The first conflict that Satan created was a conflict between relationships. And whether the relationship is personal, whether it's a war between nations, whatever the case may be, Satan, my friend, is out in the business of attacking relationships. And then what does he do? He blames it on God, some way, shape, or form. Never my fault. It's his fault, God's fault. He messed up the environment. Blame it on God for making mistakes in creation. If God was in control of things, well, if I was in control of things, it would never happen this way. Number three, he created false religious systems. False religious systems to misrepresent service and worship to God. Now, this is the most subtle. <laughs> this is incredibly subtle. When you look around the world today, all over the world, you find different different worship systems. All sorts of Christian, non-Christian, whatever the case may be, philosophical systems. I've been to Nepal. I've been to India. <laughs> all over the world, there's different worship systems. I've been through Africa, South America, Europe. There's all sorts of different worship systems. And what does he do? Well, what he's trying to do is to misrepresent God. It really doesn't matter to Satan how he does it as long as God is misrepresented. And so we find the falsehood 
of religious systems because it focuses in on service. And when you love God, you want to serve God. If you love God, you will worship God. But if he can misrepresent God, you will give service for the wrong reasons or do wrong service or you will worship in the wrong way. It really doesn't matter. Just as long as he can mess your mind up and mess your head up, he's won the battle. And friends, so Satan, what does he do? He goes out and he misrepresents his character. And like this morning, we talked about the unbiblical ideas of God, the dispensing machine God. Stick your money in your offering plate. Put your prayers in every morning. Go to church regularly and God, please, do what I want when I want. It's the dispensing machine God, the bodyguard God. God will always protect his good people. He never allows evil to happen to good people. And when I was driving down the road and there was a car cut me off and I almost got killed and there was the car veered over, oh, God saved me. Now, my friends, God may have saved in that situation. Don't misunderstand me. Don't misunderstand this situation. God does intervene, but bad things do happen to good people. And so then there's the third, the third thing, the puppeteer God. You know, it got on the strings. And it's called determinism in philosophy or in science. It's called predestination. Predestination in theological terms. Everything that happens in this world, everything that happens to me, is because God did it. God willed it. God allowed it. He is, it's his part of his great plan. Oh, my friend, please, what a perversion of the perfect, gracious will of God. Does God want you to suffer? Does he want you to have accidents to get cancer, whatever the case may be? No, a thousand, thousand times no. God is not that way. The barbecue God. If you don't accept God and you don't say the right words at the right time in the right way, you're going to burn in hell. And it's not just for a day or two or three or whatever the case may be. It's forever. It is one to the power of ten times eternity. You sin a little bit here. And please, there's no such thing as a little bit. I'm not trying to just minimize sin, friend. But this concept of the barbecue God is that God will slowly rotisserate you on the, on the spits of hell forever and ever throughout billions, trillions of years. Oh, ho, 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 my friend, what a perversion of the mercy and justice of God. And so what else did he does? Well, he's the God of no fun. Anything I, I enjoy doing? Nope, it's wrong, it's bad, it's evil. And we find a lot of that in, involving with uh, dimensions of sexuality. God is the one who is against anything that's fun and good. And then there's the placeholder God. If I'm ignorant of something, it's God who did it. It's, well, the illustration I used this morning was about lightning. Well, there was a time when lightning was thought to be the very finger of God. And there's times when I'm sure God has used lightning that way. But my friend, when we learn about atmospheric sciences, we understand that there are these forces of electricity in the clouds, etc., that can cause lightning. It's a natural occurrence. These are unbiblical, but they are first and foremost, friend, first and foremost, they are misrepresentations of what God is like. That's the key thing here. You know, truth can only have one true answer. Simple. Two plus two equals what? Four. How many right answers are there? One. How many wrong answers are there? An infinite number. God, Satan doesn't really care as long as he can mess our minds up, get us diverted, change the direction, somehow confuse us. It doesn't matter. He's in the business of misrepresenting what God is like. So here it is. Here's a God our great heavenly father, the creator of all things, the one who sustains us. And here is, excuse me, his right-hand man, so to speak, his subordinate, who rebels against him. And what does he do? How is he going to do it? Well, first of all, he could, um, he could eliminate evil before it spreads to other worlds. He could have said, you know, in my perfect foreknowledge, I know, Lucifer, that if you get onto one of the planets, you're going to really mess things up, and things are going to be so badly, badly confused, and there's going to be people suffer and die and everything else. Okay, bangle, right away. And what would have happened? He could have used the sword and destroyed it right away. And my friend, what would have happened to all the 
billions, trillions, times trillions of planets out there and all the intelligent beings of the universe, if they saw God destroy Satan the moment he realized that he was going to rebel, what would he have done? Yes, God, whatever you say, God, I will do it, God. Would there, would there have been any love in that? No. Not at all. Well, what am I going to do? Well, how about if I put you off on some planet, a dark hole, and fill it all up full of gold, and then you can just do your thing there? And throughout ceaseless ages of eternity, there would have been rebellion, but he's got lots of gold. <laughs> would that have been a solution? No. So what did God do? He chose the wiser, coarser course of action. Give it time. Demonstrate, allow to be demonstrate, demonstrated the character of Lucifer, the character of Satan. Come on, let's just give it some time. Now, <laughs> here's one of the challenges that you and I face. God, our Heavenly Father, our Creator, is not limited by time and space like we are. So for us, a day, a week, a year, sometimes is a long time. But for God, who is not confined by time and space, time is limitless. And God said, we'll just give it enough time and make a demonstration. On one hand, there will be my way of doing things. On the other hand, there will be Lucifer, Satan's way of doing things. And we will demonstrate. And then people will have the freedom to choose intelligently, knowledgeably, about which side they're going to be on. And so... God's ultimate goal, my friend, for this world and the universe is to be secure from sin and rebellion for eternity. God doesn't want rebellion. He doesn't want sin, suffering, death, war, and all these horrible things to go on throughout, the, throughout eternity. No, a million times no. But how could he do it? By forcing, rewarding, or by people, intelligent beings have the freedom to choose. And that involves a lot of time, and involves a lot of pain. It does. But ultimately, at the end of the day, my friend, what's, what is God's intent? His intent is that this world, this, <laughs> in this universe of ours, throughout all of the, the great cosmos that we have, will be free of sin, and there will be never rebellion again. Why? Because people are forced to? Because they're paid to? No because they love God and they want to follow him. Amen. Now, friend, <laughs> where do you think you stand in that? That's basically a key question that all of us need to ask. Where do I stand in this? Do I love or do I serve God because, oh, I got that vending machine. I got to stick my dollar in and get my reward out. Or do I serve God because I admire and love him? That's what our great God is looking for. Okay, let's go back to Revelation. The great dragon was cast out, that serpent who's of old, who's called the devil and Satan, who, de oh, oh, who deceives the whole world. He was cast out. Let's see, I want to make sure that I, this thing is actually, I didn't do that. Okay, I have a feeling I may have touched the wrong button here, so please forgive me. I, I'm sure it isn't our tech technicians. Okay, we're back on track here. The old devil who, ca who deceives the whole world, he's cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And so what happened? How did this planet get involved in this cosmic conflict? Now notice what the, what the Bible said in the previous world. He was cast, he de Satan deceives the whole world. He was cast out to this earth, and his angels were cast out with him. How did planet Earth become involved in this cosmic conflict? Well, we go back to the book of Genesis. And now we find how the Bible describes that this took place. We find in scriptures that God, as we described earlier, gave everybody the freedom to choose, one way or the other, okay? And so there in the garden, God said this tree, knowledge of good and evil. Adam and Eve, don't touch it. Don't touch it. He established them as free moral agents, and he gave within 
Adam and Eve and all of us the capacity and the understanding that we have innately, in us, in inside of us, a sense of right and wrong. Now, the Bible gives many other examples. It gives us a lot more instructions in the Bible on what right and wrong is. There's no question about that. But friend, every person in this world has some sense of moral rectitude in them. Yes, right or wrong. And he gave Eve the freedom to choose. And the Bible says, if you touch that tree, you will, Satan came along. Let me, let me move along in the story very quickly. The Bible says that Satan, using the medium of a serpent, and sometimes serpents are today really scary, but we have illusions from the scriptures that in reality the serpent was a very, very beautiful animal. And Satan, using that as a medium, spoke through it and says, you will not surely die, for God knows that in the days that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. He promised them a higher level, a higher plane of understanding if they would just follow him. And after Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden fruit, they were filled with guilt and anxiety. You know, friends, God never intended for guilt to happen in our lives. <laughs> he never intended that. It was after they sinned that guilt and anxiety came to them. God created human beings with a phenomenal potential for good, for creativity, for excellence. He never intended for us to have guilt. Now, let me pause for a second here. There is such a thing as false guilt. And then there's real guilt. And somebody might someday, <laughs> to use the expression, lay a guilt trip on you. Have you ever had that happen? Somebody says, oh, that's very, very bad. Wrong, wrong, wrong. And etc. goes through all the laws. Why is it so bad? What's wrong with it? Oh, it's just bad because it's bad. It's because I say it's bad. Oh, really? They lay a guilt trip on us. That is false guilt. And friend, Satan is in the bill of business of creating false guilt. So there is good guilt and there is bad guilt. And false guilt is bad guilt. He doesn't want that. You and I, God intended, will be free of guilt. We would have a clear conscience and always be free of the wonderful blessings that, that God has given to us. And friends, when God made Adam and Eve, when he created this human family, when he made each one of us as individuals, he made us with phenomenal potential for good. All of the giftedness, the strengths, the abilities, all of these things in each one of us. I'm amazed. You know, even here in, in, in these meetings, this is the third meeting, we have a remarkable team in this facility. Unfortunately, those of you who are watching online haven't met all of them. One of these evenings, we're going to list all of the people who are participating. I mean, we got 50, 60 people who are helping every day in this program in various different ways, shapes, and forms. But my friend, this giftedness just didn't happen. It is because these individuals, the volunteers in this program, are doing a phenomenal job learning, studying, growing all the, all the wonderful things, and they're becoming an outstanding television production crew. I say praise God for each one of you. <laughs> but my friends, God has put that potential for, uh, for music, for all sorts of different artistic things, all for excellence in, in the heart of every one of us. He created us to be perfect and good. But human nature has become corrupted by Satan becoming the prince of this world, and he has degraded every human being. Now, friend, here we come to the, to the rubber meets the road, the so what, the so what, the issues that impact every one of us. In contrast to God creating human beings pure, holy, and with every inclination to good, Satan has corrupted humanity to be self-centered, envious, competitive, greedy, immoral, prioritizing, and trusting other things rather than God, and to be violent. We could go on a whole catalog of horrible things that the human race is part of. If you don't believe that, do you know who the most selfish person in the world is? Who is it? It's a baby. <laughs> I see a new mama here. <laughs> and when baby gets hungry, what does he do? Well, I won't demonstrate. He, <laughs> he screams his head off, and he wants it when? Now. <laughs> and on it goes. There is nobody more selfish than a baby. And on it grows. We are all egoistic. We are corrupt. 
Now, friends, here's the paradox. On one hand, we're made perfect with phenomenal potential for good. And on the other hand, there is this seed of corruption. Every evil thing that you can possibly imagine is capable in the mind of every human being. Every violent, horrible, horrible thing is that's where, what we're capable of. God didn't make us that way, but we have become corrupted. And the reason you and I need a savior is because of that problem, my friend. In part, and because of that problem, we need a change of heart. When Jesus said, you must be born again, he was talking about this corrupt human nature. On one hand, phenomenal potential. On the other hand, phenomenal potential for evil. And Jesus said, if you want to be changed, you need that transformation of heart and mind and nature. And that's what God wants to give to every one of us. Okay? So this is what happened. Satan corrupted this world, and we became fallen, fallen, fallen from the highest state that God intended to the lowest state of, of this world. So what has happened? Well, look at the horrible things represented in that picture. That poor lady groveling through the garbage to find a few little things. Violence, sickness, all of these things, it's horrible. Sin produces anxiety, fear, suffering, death. And who is responsible? My friend, it is Satan, the adversary, the accuser, the devil, all of these things. And today, you and I here, wherever we live on planet Earth, whether it's in Vancouver or Prince George or, or Whitehorse or, or White Rock, it doesn't matter. We all are individuals who are behind enemy lines, and Satan claims to be the owner of every one of us. This Earth belongs to Satan. The pain, war, suffering, disasters are not an act of God. You know, in the insurance clauses, they have this, they call it the act of God. They're not the act of God at all. They're the act of Satan. We live in a cosmic battlefield. We are born citizens of Satan's kingdom. And so when Jesus came to this earth and he died on the cross, he came to win us back. He came to take ownership of us. And so this characterization of Satan of being this little imp with a long tail and a pitchfork to throw people into hell, my friend, that's totally, it's one of Satan's misrepresentations of the real problem. It's one of Satan's misrepresentation. Satan isn't like that. I dare say that if he was walking here tonight, you wouldn't find a more sophisticated, well-educated, well-spoken, well-mannered individual in the entire world, but he would be demonic to the core. Oh, my friends, let's remember that we're fighting against what the Bible describes. We're not fighting against human beings. We're fighting against principalities. Notice the word principalities. Principality means that Satan claims this world as his. And there are principalities where Satan's evil angels are doing everything that they possibly can to fight us. So somebody says, well, why doesn't God do something? Why do have these terrible situations of exploitation? Well, he has. God has. He sent Jesus to this world. Jesus met Satan in the, in the uh, wilderness in temptation. Jesus went to the cross. All of these things was in response to God in part. This is the greatest demonstration. But God has done something down through the ages. And God's garden promise. There in the Garden of Eden, God promised to, to Eve and Adam, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you, sh and you shall bruise his heel. God said you put enmity, enmity. What is enmity? Enmity is a sense of fighting. And when, excuse me, when you and I are faced with situations which are where we have a choice between good and evil, we might be... We might feel a great desire to do evil, but there is a force pulling us in this direction. There is a battle that is taking place. It is for the loyalty of who are we going to serve. And here it promised that someday the woman, the seed of the woman, would bruise and kill Satan. Well, God has done something, my friend. That's why Jesus came to this world. And God, Jesus hung on the cross. He died on the cross. Why? Because the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Anybody who rebels against God will ultimately die. And so on the cross of Jesus, on the cross, Jesus hung on the cross taking my death. 
And what does the Bible describe for us here? And, and, and notice these phrases from the Gospel of John. Now is the judgment of this world. Now is the, what's that word? The ruler of this world will be cast out. And here in John 16, because the ruler of this world, when Jesus went to the cross, he realized that he was not fighting against the Roman soldiers or the, or the Jewish leaders. No, he was fighting against Satan, the enemy of humanity who claimed to be the ruler of this world. And he was saying, now as the ruler of this world will be cast out. The dominion of Satan claiming this world as his own was contested and Jesus won the battle. Jesus was the second Adam. In the, in the book of Romans. It says, through one man's offense, judgment came to all men. Who's that one man? That's Adam. Adam and Eve sinned. Because of that, oh, because of that offense, judgment came to all men. All were condemned. So through one man, that's Jesus, righteous, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. You see, my friend, when we're on Satan's side and we give our hearts to, to, to Jesus and we, give our, we come back to God, we pass from death to life. We pass from the condemnation of Satan to the acceptance that God gives to every one of his children. For by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So also, by one man's obedience, many shall be made righteous. Jesus was the person who obeyed perfectly. He came as the second Adam. He came to demonstrate that Adam, as man, humanity, as originally created by God, could keep all of God's commandments. And when he lived a perfect life and he died on the cross in our behalf, he gave his perfect righteousness so that you and I can say, dear God, I want his righteousness to stand for me. And because Jesus is the infinite God, his sacrifice is worth an infinite amount. And it stands for every one of us who want to give our hearts and our minds to him. What did God do? Well, he's done something. He gave the life of Jesus so that you and I could be redeemed. And the cross reveals the enormity, the enormity of God's love. Now, there's, there's not only the substitutionary role that, or the substitutionary act that Jesus provided on the cross, my friend, but more than that, the cross reveals that God just didn't stand distant. There are some views of God in the false representations of God where God is pictured as standing high and mighty and raised up and not part of humanity. And somewhere over in the case, you the, the, the he peeps backing up. Oh, there's humanity. There's all those sinful people down there separated from me. Oh, I'm, I'm holy. I'm good. No, 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 my friends. Jesus got right down into the stable. He, he was a tradesman. He got his hands dirty. He was a person who understood our lives, and he went to the cross, and the cross with all the pain and the suffering is so that God understands when you've got cancer. God understands when your spouse isn't faithful to you. God understands when, you're, when your son or your daughter rejects your leadership in the home. God understands when you have accidents. God understands when you go through financial reverses. All of these things, my friend, our great God, under, he understands those things because he has gone through the pain and the suffering and the sickness of real humanity. And so Jesus, when he came, when he came out, of the, out of the tomb, when he was resurrected on that morning, Jesus accomplished by his, what did Jesus accomplish on his death of the cross? The Bible says he reconciled the world to himself. Consistent with his own character, the creator himself provided forgiveness, reconciliation, and recreation. You and I, as we give our hearts to him and let the Holy Spirit come in, and Jesus is our substitute, and we live for him day by day, gradually, step by step by step. What happens? We're transformed to be more and more like God. More and more like Jesus. And we are changed step by step. One of my favorite verses is Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18. The path of the just person is like the light coming up in the morning, the sun coming up in the morning. Minute by minute, it gets brighter and brighter until the perfect day. And my friend, I'm glad today that you and I don't need to 
be worried. Our job is to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, and God changes us, transforms us step by step to be like him. What Jesus accomplished on the cross was that he demonstrated that God is a God of love. Before the world, before the universe, he showed the claims of Satan are false. He died in my place. He provided forgiveness for all. He died in the place of everyone who will ever live on this earth. And what does his resurrection prove? Jesus claimed that he was God. He, if, if that claim was false, my friend, he would never have been resurrected. But the fact that he came from the, from the tomb by the power that was inherent in him, because he is God in the fullest sense, Jesus is the eternal, almighty God who came in and he was resurrected by the power of divinity. He is God. The resurrection affirms his full and total, complete divinity. He is fully divine and he has the power to forgive sin. When the people, when the, when the parents paralytic came to him and here he was laying on the ground Jesus said son your sins be forgiven you wow what a privilege have you ever had Jesus say that to you I have I'm thankful for the forgiveness that God gives. He is the Son of Man. In, the, in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, it's used over 80 times in the gospel. Jesus describes himself as the Son of Man. The Son of Man in the book of Daniel is the Almighty God. And Jesus claimed that title as his own. When he, died, when he was resurrected, it affirmed that claim. He is the Messiah, and he defeated Satan. And I love it the way it describes in the book of Hebrews. He's the best lawyer that any one of us could ever have. We don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness. No, Jesus has experienced that. He hung on the cross. He lived an ordinary life, but was at all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore, the reason for this is, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy to find grace and help to help in time of need. My friend, at the very moment of temptation, when you and I are faced with those cravings and those desires and the external forces that would just drive us to want to, to sin, that's the time, my friend, that Jesus says, I'll come in and help you at those moments. And he does, friend. He does. Yes, it's challenging, but, the, but my friend, God will stand with us. Now, there's another, there's another dimension here that I want to bring into the big picture we're, because we're going to look at this a little bit more uh, t uh, tomorrow. And that is the end time judgment vindicates the character of God. In the Bible, the Bible describes three judgments. One is the end time judgment, the time that we're living in now, where all of the answers, all of the questions uh, by heavenly beings about the character of God are answered. Right now, there is a great heavenly judgment taking place. And the primary question is, is God really fair, righteous, justice, holy, and kind, and merciful? And the heavenly beings, I mean, all of the beings of the entire universe are, are, have the opportunity. The evidence is laid out before them, and they have a chance to get that answer. Then there is the thousand years after Jesus comes. All questions by, by, by God's followers, you and me, about the character of God are going to be answered. I'll tell you, when I go to heaven, when I get to heaven, excuse me, when I get to heaven, I've got some questions about why God allowed certain things and did certain things on this earth. <laughs> Do you have some of those questions? I, 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 I've got lots of questions. And I want to go, I'm looking forward to a walk with Jesus, and he's going to pull off the, out the hard disks or whatever they have up there in heaven for the memories. He's going to show us, show the videos of my life, your life, etc. And he's going to say, hey, this is what was happening. And look, this is what was happening behind the scenes. And this is what I wanted for your life. And what I did was the most merciful, kind, gracious thing. And Satan was doing that. He, he attacked. He did this. My angels did that. And we protected you. And we're going to see it. And all of the questions about by God's followers of the character of God will be answered at that time. And then there's the third great judgment where all, at the end of the thousand years, all of the wicked are raised to life and they gather around the, the new Jerusalem and the Bible says that they will see all of the judgments of God, all of his actions, and they will say, just and true are your ways, all, O King Almighty. My friend, we live in a time when God is going to wrap this thing up and the universe, when God is finished, is secure from sin because God has demonstrated the truthfulness of his character. I like the way Revelation chapter 15, verses 3 and 4 describes it. 
And here it's describing at the end of, the, of this judgment process. Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of Saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. For all nations, what? All nations, all nations, that's all people of every time, of every, throughout the ceaseless age, through all the ages of the earth's history, all nations shall come and worship before you for your judgments, not are going to be, not have been, but have been manifested. The way in which God has dealt with the problem of sin in, the, in this judgment process is open before the entire universe, and when it's all said and done, they say, your judgments are right. You are just. You are pure. You are holy. Your ways, O king of saints. And God is vindicated. God is vindicated. The accusations of Satan are shown to be null and void. And what happens then? Then we find that God is going to contain Satan. And the Bible describes it this way. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. Therefore, I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth. You shall become a horror and shall be no more forever. Satan is going to be destroyed, my friends. What do you say? Amen. I say amen to that. Because God is working in a way that vindicates his characters, that shows that the way of love, of free choice, of respect, admiration is the only way in which there is security for this entire universe. And Satan is going to be destroyed. Now I want to point out to you that even Satan, even Lucifer, who has created and caused all sin, is going to be destroyed. He's going to be ashes upon the face of the earth. This whole idea that God is going to rotisserate us, the wicked, on the spits of hell forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, even Satan is going to be turned into ashes. That whole misrepresentation of the character of God is false. And this morning, today, this evening, I want to invite you to take the invitation of Jesus. Jesus is extending an invitation to every one of us. He invites, will you ask Jesus to be your savior and forgive you of your sin? Will you do that? Amen. Will you give to Jesus your loyalty and let him be the Lord of your life? Not only here in this auditorium, my friend, but I want to say, extend this invitation to you who are watching online or YouTube, subsequent programs. Jesus wants to be your savior. Amen. He's inviting you. He invites every one of us. Give me your heart. Give me your loyalty. Give me your loyalty. I died for you. I've done everything I possibly can for you. I want to be your friend. I want to be a personal savior for you. Will you do that? Oh, friends, tonight, Jesus wants you to do that. It only takes a, a simple decision. Remember, you are a free moral agent. Every one of us have the freedom to reject or accept. And Jesus invites you to accept him tonight as he's died on the cross for every one of us. So, friend, tonight, I want to encourage you. Give your heart to Jesus tonight in a very special way. Okay, our program, our program for tonight is, is completed. Tomorrow... Tomorrow evening, 7 p.m., miracles reveal what God is really like. And then uh, on Monday night, when will the end of the world come? Boy, oh, oh no, excuse me, I've got myself mixed up here. It's not fair. We're dealing with the judgment tomorrow. And then on Monday is miracles, what is God is really like. And then Tuesday, when will the end of the world come? So make sure you're with us every night for 10 nights. We're going to be ending on next Saturday night, so plan to come. We've given, we've planned for Thursday night to be uh, a night when, uh, when we don't have a program. You can do your laundry, go shopping, whatever the case may be, but plan to be here every night. Now, before we go to our Q&A period, and I'm glad to see uh, Pastor Peter coming up here, and I see he's got his Bible with him, and, and uh, oh my, a whole bunch of questions. Ay, 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 this is going to be fun tonight, Pastor. <laughs> I'm enjoying this. But look, at, some of you may need to leave, and uh, I'd like to invite us to, uh, if, you, if you need to go wherever, we're going to have a, have a Q&A period for about 15, 20 minutes, and then our program will end. But right now, let's just pause for a word of prayer. And for those of you who do need to go, you're free to go at this time. Let's bow our heads and pray. 
Our gracious Father in heaven, thank you, thank you, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for your patience. Thank you that you are a God of love. Thank you that you respect us so much that you will do everything to protect our freedom of choice, to choose or to reject you. And Lord, tonight I just pray that you would please touch the heart of every person in, in our programs here, and that they will give their heart and their life totally and completely to you. Oh, Father, we want to see Jesus come. We want this painful situation of earth to come to a close, but we want to be throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity with you in a universe that is free of sin. And we thank you that that day will come soon. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, thank you for those of you, uh, uh, for everybody who's come. If you, please stay by. We want you to stay by, but if you must go, you're free to go. Uh, Pastor Peter, what is the first question? First question, take a seat. Maybe it's a heart. <laughs> <laughs> take a seat. That's a good one. Okay. But, and, and, and pick up my Bible, right? <laughs> well, you doesn't hurt. <laughs> That's right. Well, the first question uh, that was asked, if God is personal, how can we have a relationship with him? You mentioned in your presentation that God is personal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how can we have a relationship with him if he's personal? Good question. Now, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to give you a wrong answer, but I'm going to ask you, how would I have a personal relationship with you? Take time to spend. Takes time? We've got to hang out together? What else? Listen to each other, talk to each other. Yeah, really listen. Not just, <laughs> but really listen. What else? Do things together. Do things together. Well, that same basic idea of how to, how to have a time with God. Uh, how, do you, how do you spend time with God? For me, it's in prayer. It's in studying of his word. It's in coming to church, listening to his servants. Mm -hmm. It's um, trying to help people in our community by adding value to them, allowing God to use me to bless others. Right. Uh, the friends, that's a very good answer. I hope you caught it. Um, spending time together, reading, learning, praying, serving. Great answer. Thank you. Uh, now, I don't know who the person was. Maybe you've got another one for us. <laughs> yes. Uh, another one is about, uh, they ask about, uh, what about the other prophecies? Uh, in the presentation was mentioned that there are prophecies in the Bible that were fulfilled, but there are other prophecies that are not biblical. Let's say Notre Dame, Nostradamus, and also even some psychics. So how, how do we look at that? And when I was looking at this uh, question, um, it's true that there are other prophecies bes beside biblical. Oh, yes. Uh, no question about that. But when you compare them, there is no comparison. In the sense that every single Bible prophecy was fulfilled. When you look at other prophecies that exist, they were not all fulfilled. Some of them were not fulfilled at all, and some of them were fulfilled. So for me, and the Bible is teaching us that if a prophet arises among you and says something that will happen, and if it doesn't happen, it's not a prophet from God. So in, in, us, other words, in other words, there's tests of a prophet. Right. There are ways in which we can test them out. And so if anybody makes a claim, I'm a prophet or whatever the case may be, we have to respect that and consider it seriously. But we compare it with the biblical test of a prophet. And in one of our future Bible studies, I want to go into that, into that subject in a lot more detail to, so we can learn exactly what those tests are. Because the Bible warns us that at the end time there will be false prophets. Yep. But they're also true yes. prophets. Yeah. So how do we make distinction? One of the tests is that their prophecy has to come through all of them, not just some. So, but we'll learn more about Good. that later. Okay, the next question that was, uh, what argument can be used when um, arguing with someone who does not believe in God? And they believe everything is self-existent. This morning you were addressing that issue. I did, I did. Um, first of all, when we meet somebody who doesn't believe in God, argument usually doesn't work. A, a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. So you can produce, you can present every conceivable argument in the world, and the person will still can still say, "I don't believe it. <laughs> I don't believe it." Okay, but I, I think that there is a, a there's another way that is actually more convincing, and that is first of all recognize the freedom of choice. It's not a matter of 
give me your arm, I'm going to twist it off, and if you, if you don't believe, you're going to go to hell, blah, 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 and scare them, you know, try to scare people and things like that. No, no. The best way, it is to be a loving, kind friend and say, you know, I learned this, I discovered that, this is how I've learned, and by your life, you demonstrate that belief in God produces a life that is very, very different and meaningful than the person who does it. So take some of the points that I've outlined in the sermon or in the talk this morning and live a good life and be a friend to them. Sometimes we come with an attitude, we want to win the argument. And you even might win the argument but lose the person. Yeah. So God has never called us to go around and win the arguments. It's to win people. So you have to be wise as a serpent and harmless as doves. Yeah. And the first thing, if they don't see that God in you, no argument that you have can make them believe. That's right. <laughs> Pastor Peter, I like the way Jesus said, you are my witnesses. He didn't say you are my lawyers. <laughs> he didn't say you are my <laughs> whatever. He says you are my witnesses. You tell what Jesus did for you. Be a loving, kind person. We should not be controversial, confrontive Christians. We do not become righteous by definition. We become righteous because of a relationship with Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Another question, it was, um, uh, it says, on your Friday night presentation, why do you show the stone falling from the sky when scriptures clearly says the stone was cut out of a mountain without hands. Therefore, what does the mountain that the stone was cut represent and what does the stone represent? Okay, that's a very good biblical question. Um, in the Bible, and, and I, I'm hearing this for the first time, so yes. uh, please understand, I, we could give Already you many <laughs> biblical references on this, but in the Bible, a mountain, the stone, a huge big granite m mountain is a symbol of God. God is my rock, okay? And this hymn, Rock of Ages Cleft for Me, in a sense, comes from that imagery that is found in the Bible. The Bible uses the metaphor of a great mountain as being a mountain of God. Now, in the Daniel chapter 2, it says the stone was cut out without hands. It was miraculous. So here we have God represented by the mountain, and the rock is cut out without hands. It's supernatural. In other words, this is a supernatural intervention that is taking place. Thirdly, not only is Daniel part of the Bible, obviously, it's a vital part of the Bible, but we have, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, we have the whole of scriptures, and uh, I'm going to be taking up here, I think it's on Monday night, uh, the topic of how is Jesus going to come? How soon is Jesus going to come? And so we put together all of the Bible texts that have to do with how Jesus is going to return. And in this way, we learn that the symbol of the stone, which is a symbol of God's eternal kingdom, is actually coming from outside of this world to this world. So in that sense, it's coming from above. So uh, the, the key thing here is not so much the direction or if there's gravity involved. The key thing is it comes from God, and it's God's supernatural action in creating a, the, the world for us. Yeah, and uh, when you look at the prophecy, the metal represents the human kingdoms. Yes. And yes. the stone represents divine kingdom. It's different then. And also represents God himself and Messiah. And the stone, uh, the stone is of divine origin, but also of divine nature. And that's why you also have the Satan wanting to come on the mountain of God. Remember yeah, that yeah. we just yeah. read in Ezekiel? So when we talk about that, uh, it's represented of God and his kingdom. And then his kingdom spreads all. That stone becomes a mountain. But it comes from another mountain, which is God. And to this earth, it's supernatural, as it was said, and it's of divine origin. And that's why it's spread all over the world. So that's just one of the answers for this question. And if you want to find out a little bit more, I was just checking. Uh, there is a book by Jacques Ducan called Secrets of Daniel. And he's explaining a little bit more about the mountain and stone using the Hebrew terms. But also, what was belief of the Babylonians concerning the mountain? The answer that uh, interpretation that Daniel gave helped 
uh, Nebuchadnezzar understand also from his theology, theological point of view what was God trying to say. So I would encourage you to get that book. Yeah. Uh, Jacques Tucan is an excellent scholar and very readable writer. Yes. Good. And the last question for tonight is, uh, why couldn't Saddam Hussein rebuild Babylon, Mr. Thor? <laughs> why you forgot Saddam... to tell them. <laughs> well, <laughs> I didn't have time uh, on Friday evening to explain that there is a Bible prophecy that said that the, the site of Babylon would be completely abandoned, completely abandoned. At the time of Daniel, it was the, the capital of the world. But the Bible predicted that someday that the city of Babylon would, be, would become a ruin, be completely abandoned, and it would never, ever be rebuilt. And that's true. They may have rebuilt, you know, like museums at the edge of the city and all those kind of things, but the city has never, ever been rebuilt. Little portions of it, the, the different camps or different uh, small villages that are around the circle. But uh, Saddam Hussein uh, was really fighting against the reality of Bible prophecy and God, well, tragic, tragic, tragic situation of war and, and desolation, all those kind of things. He never rebuilt the city. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for your time. We want to encourage you to send us your questions. 778-400-9533. Uh, 778-400-9533. So it's on the screen now. Uh, please, uh, please send us your questions. Like these are very, very good questions. And so we're going to take every night. We're going to have a question and answer period like this, and we invite you to stay. Now uh, we'll see how things go, but we might even start a little chat circle. So those of you who are online, if you want to dialogue with us, we would be able to do that. But for tonight, thank you so much. We appreciate you being here. Pastor Peter, let's have prayer to, be, to close. Would you please pray yes. for us? Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity that we could be here, learn more about you. I pray that as we learn more about you, we become more like you. So when Jesus come, we, comes very soon, we'll be in that great crowd welcoming you and enjoying eternity forever. Uh, give us a traveling mercy back home. Uh, give us a good night rest. Yes. Remind us to move our clocks for one hour so we won't be late for tomorrow and thank you for answering this prayer in jesus name amen amen i'm glad you prayed about the time change brother <laughs> thank you friends for coming it's been great to have you here you're a very attentive audience bring a friend and come back tomorrow night we'll see you god bless thank you